all, um, I'm between you and lunch. And I know it's a little bit chilly in the room, but uh, hopefully I've got some interesting things to, to chat about. As Nish said, uh, we're going to talk a bit about the future. Um, I can see visions. I can speak to the animals. So I'm going to tell you what it's like to, uh, to, to understand where we're trying to go at Cisco and really not only just talk about what we just heard from the partners, focusing on rebuilding existing data centers and how to incorporate IP, which has been a discussion in the industry for a couple of years now, with the equipment now generally available and able to construct those data centers, but what can you do with all of the tools that we have available at Cisco and, and what are we thinking about? So as we just went through, uh, we talked a bit about SDI to IP, we talked a bit about virtualization, but we've made some significant steps uh, forward towards this and the, shift, and the shift towards using COTS-based equipment to be able to build hybrid broadcast studios and then how to incorporate that for remote studio production. In particular, we focused really on the oper operationalization as well, not just on the placement and provisioning of these workloads, but then enabling the partners to have the data and telemetry coming out of that equipment to be able to fully understand and analyze what's going on inside those data centers. So let's jump right in. So really where we're headed is we're trying to enable not only cost, um, flexibility, as was mentioned, um, as well as future proofing, but we want to take the next step forward and actually enable us to do more with uh, the creative side of broadcast and content production and utilize more to create a more entertaining and more creative uh, set of content and shows. To do this, we've had to fundamentally also change how we've constructed equipment. So in, in some, what's, although the partners didn't mention this, um, in an enterprise data center, most often that's a full mesh of connectivity with assumed ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous connectivity with infinite bandwidth. And the issue is that when building a broadcast uh, data center or a media data center, you need very specific traffic engineered flows. You need to make sure that you can do frame accurate switching. There's a number of features that were necessary that were fundamentally different than enterprise switching. And so unlike others, I want to make sure this group understands uh, that we understand that although broadcast engineering does consider itself to be uh, a special flower industry, in fact, there are very specific features that were necessary. Thankfully, um, we've found additional value for those feature sets across, uh, across multiple industries. We can talk about that in a little bit. A couple of other things we wanted to be able to do because uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is, of course, the use of cloud resources, public cloud, not only for distribution, but potentially for production and hybrid environments where there's on-prem, but then there's burstable capacity within a private cloud. Um, and we focus there. Last, what was mentioned uh, in the panel is that we're shifting the ecosystem from being appliance-based, moving that to potentially being bare metal on compute, in some cases being able to move that to hypervisors, but really then push onto cloud native. Our goal at Cisco is to be able to orchestrate across all of those technologies seamlessly. Um, and, and so I'm gonna show you a bit of that. So just in sum, what the partners are working on in the workflow is above this red line. And we're trying to create an infrastructure platform that enables rapid programming of those workflows onto that infrastructure with the minimal amount of human intervention to get that done. And so just to quick recap, 10 years of networking history, none of this was programmable up to eight years ago, and that was called software-defined networking. Second, each and every one of these links at these different layers, from the actual physical resources to the, to the cabling topology to the virtual overlay topology to be created for the workflows, to create the policy of, as was mentioned, source-specific flows to destination-specific flows and load engineering, to the actual service view that was being deployed, that's what the workload management is trying to accomplish. And just a few years ago, as I, as I mentioned, each and every bubble that you see on this whole diagram, the line going between, those were hand configured. And that was an impossible task to, to, work, to work at the speed and flexibility that we just discussed with the panel. And all of this from compute storage to networking to the virtual overlays is now, is now programmable and can be visualized and analyzed. 
So to make my point, uh, this is some work that we did with Kyron Hego, and we did this at uh, the last IBC and NAB. And so here we're scheduling what, from a Cisco perspective, is a network topology with, their, with a set of uh, resources and appliances that they have where we're orchestrating across three different clouds. One was bare metal, one was hypervisor with uh, VMware, and the last one is a container-based cloud creating one production flow using the exact same uh, mechanism and, and user interface that they have with their product to orchestrate across different clouds. And, and again, from our perspective, uh, this is simply orchestrating the different uh, infrastructure equipment, creating the physical topology, or sorry, addressing the physical topology, creating a virtual topology, creating that service flow as orchestrated by our partners. And we have many examples with all the partners that you just discussed and, and, and several deployments that really function the same way. And what, what's been different in that last piece that you saw with a bunch of squiggly graphs is we now have the telemetry and inspection points and probes available in the infrastructure to absolutely understand timing, delay, jitter, bandwidth, utilization of each of those uh, virtual appliances or containerized appliances. Where we go with this, just as a preview, because we're gonna talk about quite a bit of technology, is trying to fundamentally change the experience of what can be done with user, uh, with per user uh, created broadcast. And by utilizing concurrent devices, so here we are um, watching the Warriors kill the Cavaliers in the NBA Finals. Although they may appear to be different teams, it's really the Warriors winning the championship. And, but what we're doing here is changing the way that we have social viewing. Twitter feeds, social media feeds are interesting, but what we, can, what we know we can do with personalized broadcast content or personalized content is utilize different camera angles across the social viewing that they have. We can incorporate our collaboration suite to be able to allow them to have both audio and video sharing as well as the, the personalized frames that you saw between the two different teams, and then get analytics of what's actually happening uh, at each site within that multi-viewing party. This, we have pulled together out of our portfolio. We have all of those pieces to be able to do this. And that's really the direction that we're heading, trying to not only focus on cost, flexibility, workflow management, backwards compatibility, and interoperability, but get to the point where we can create new experiences. So, as was mentioned um, over the interoperability piece, there was a number of myths in the industry about what we were able to do with IP-based equipment. And we've been knocking down a number of these over time, and I'll show that in a second. But the challenges that had to be overcome over the last several years and why we're in 2018 able to talk about de actual deployments, multiple proofs of concept, is that we've ended up over the last few years knocking down several of the challenges that were there and creating solutions out of them that uh, Nish is describing you today uh, over the entire uh, course of today. We also have been pushing a number of these into open source. And the point of this is that we're trying to enable the industry to be on this trajectory. And second, we realize the industry won't adopt this technology if there's not an understanding of the technology, the ability to inspect how it works, and the ability to potentially contribute to its, its functionality and feature set. So we've used not only the construction of products, building of solutions, uh, focusing on standards, but also bringing this to open source. So as I mentioned, there was a number of myths, in particular about 4K uncompressed, um, and working within the SMPTE standards that said, IP equipment can't solve this problem. And second thing that I want to mention is that IP is not just the top of rack switch. When you, when you have virtual appliances or containerized appliances, you need to talk about virtual switching and routing. And that virtual switching and routing in conjunction with that hardware also needs to perform all of these features and functionality. And it was considered that software actually can't pace according to spec. And so, we believe, we, we believe we've solved that problem and have some data to show that on these pace streams. And one by one, we've knocked out every myth that was there that IP equipment, both hardware and software, can't solve this. And we believe we've knocked them down. And so towards this end, we've created the, the virtual media interface for 
applications to work with virtual switching and routing in conjunction with the hardware-based routing to be able to take uncompressed uh, 4K streams and bring this directly into the application. And this is how we work with our partners. We're delivering it directly to them such that they can program the work workflows and workloads as they're orchestrating with you for the creative output that you're looking for. And also, we've open sourced this. Once again, to make sure the industry can understand how the technology works, have access to it, uh, and contribute to it. So just quickly, we've got the heart, again, we can call the IP domain, the fabric, the media data center hardware infrastructure where the compute is attaching according to the leaves or the gateways that has an IP data plane, bring it up to the virtual media interface, and then we can send it directly into the, our partners' applications, their workflows, uh, and their products as well. This was the tricky bit. We can fling a lot of bits, we've got a lot of features, but can we do it according to spec? And so towards that end, we now have also incorporated at each of these points in the virtual switch router probes and instrumentation to fully understand input and output going in and out of those appliances. So we have an understanding of what the container pods uh, and, the fr and looking at frame rate monitoring and, and full analytics associated with this. And then just for example, taking a look at hardware versus software as grass valleys within spec, the software pacing is within spec as well, uh, utilizing the computer infrastructure that's there. And so just taking a look at this uh, in a quick video on, the, on this demo, here we are firing up another topology as we see it. We fire it up and it goes live in a containerized world and you're gonna see how, how uh, these containers fire up. It's up and running, so this is how fast our partners can orchestrate the workflows. We have a couple of paths with a common feed that are each with different latencies, and can we synchronize them in a multi-viewer output? And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So here comes Big Bunny uh, coming out. Um, again, multiple streams of Big Bunny, and, and keeping them all synced from, from the source across the hardware, software, and up to the application side, and have it synced in and, and paced out. And that's what we showed at NAB this year. And so towards this end, um, to make sure we can do this, we've got a performance dashboard that we built in out of those probes to fully understand exactly what's happening all the way across that workflow. And just a year ago, again, it maybe have, have been possible to provision uh, the IP data center or IP fabric for media to, to perform SDI to IP conversion, but now just like we've had every TAPS monitors and probes across an SCI network or baseband network, we have that across an IP network as well. And so just taking a look a little bit more at exactly what we're looking at here, we've got the signal frame gap, uh, as well as a, num a bit of data before, that just got a little out of order. So I'm going quickly, because much of this is a recap of exactly where we are as an industry, and you've heard uh, from Pierre this morning on his use case, but I wanna give you a couple more that we've actually been working on as well. So the way that, and what we've built out is in fact a media pod. So we have IP fabric for media, which does the connectivity, um, but we've also built out with compute and storage resources in our hyperconverged infrastructure, a turnkey deployment to be able to drop this directly into uh, broadcast studios incorporated all the software that I've discussed, and then uh, work, enable this for physical appliances, bare metal, hypervisor deployments, container deployments, and orchestrated across all of those. And uh, we've had this deployed at the last IBC, NAB, uh, for a bit, and we are driving our partner's booths across fiber out of this one data center pod. And so that's been, uh, been quite impressive that we were able to drive out of one rack of kit, full workflows, running our booths, running their booths, um, and, and showing that this is available now. So a couple of points, we've been working with SWR, um, and what's interesting about what they've been trying to accomplish is that they create, as, as uh, many know, um, rapid, uh, rapid deployment of different concerts and entertainment um, activities for visual radio, as they call it, and in fact, we've shrunk down their 
um, entire production studio to a lightly, um, lightly populated rack of equipment. And so we've, we've started running this live with them. Next, Canal Plus, and I'll appear up in a second to talk more about this, but um, converting studios, performing remote production in particular, and heading down the path of incorporating more and more um, IP equipment virtualization, as Pierre mentioned. NBCU, you're going to hear about this uh, quite a bit this afternoon of what we've done with them. But one particular piece of this is creating a virtual studio. Uh, and just focusing on the picture for a second, there's a number of capture devices as well as processing appliances, virtualized and containerized, in a catalog that can be rapidly deployed into a workflow such that instead of creating a snowflake design for, in this particular case, a basketball event, you can have a catalog of, of topologies, a catalog of potential appliances and services you want to apply into that workflow, and literally drag and drop them into that workflow and rapidly deploy it. In addition, by having um, an understanding of what that capture topology is going to look like, we can, of course, automatically detect and enable the security or filters as necessary for those specific devices to be attached to only specific ports and also load engineer that traffic across it. We also did some work with To Immerse uh, with the BBC and, and British Telecom in which we were uh, rapidly producing and delivering um, the, the media applications and in particular for MotoGP. Whoops, there we go, a little step forward fast. And so we're able to um, really take object-based object uh, media and process that, and uh, you'll hear more about that this afternoon as well. Last, you'll be hearing uh, quite a bit from NBC about the Rio Olympics. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, on, on the Olympics deployments now for, for many, many years and have learned quite a bit about how to uh, deliver that video and also build uh, some remote production facilities. And I'll leave that uh, for that discussion this afternoon. So the way we've constructed these products and these solutions uh, really was starting off with COTS-based data center equipment and working through uh, back, in, back in IBC in 2016, creating a 4K uncompressed pipeline with manual configuration, moving that through a fully automated and orchestrated workflow, everything below that red line, increasing the ecosystem of partners that we have uh, working with us towards this IP journey, um, scavenging extra resources or cycles that were available in the data center for doing transcoding and quality control to increase the efficiency and utilization of the data center. Uh, also adding through our uh, pr previous portfolio of deployment, a glass to glass production to distribution mechanism incorporating multi-cloud and hybrid cloud by our cloud center or clicker acquisition. And what this allowed us to do was rapidly deploy in any environment, on-prem, private cloud, uh, public cloud resources. And where we're headed, uh, what we've done this year was create the multi-cloud pod out of different, different types of technology, physical appliances, bare metal hypervisor containers, as mentioned, added the probing and end-to-end -end analytics, creating VMI such that we have a virtual SDI to IP uh, pacing and standards-based implementation, and then uh, open sourcing that as well. So we've been working quite a bit towards this industry, trying to make the SDI to IP transition fa uh, happen faster for all the benefits that the partner mentioned, but really also to, to fundamentally change creative as well. The ecosystem support, which started out just a couple of years ago, uh, fairly scarce, has now the number of partners that we've picked up and worked with and are on this journey together to enable this transition is getting much, much larger. As well as we're making much larger steps into standardization, proving out the standards, correcting the standards, uh, adhering to the standards as necessary, and using open source to, uh, to move the industry forward. Next, what we've done with, in, an, in a partnership with Intel is build an ecosystem proof lab. So uh, many of our customers are saying, stop telling me you can do this and start showing me you can do this. 
And in Silicon Valley with Intel, we've built an interoperability lab where we invite all partners in the industry and everyone in the industry to come, both customers as well as vendors and suppliers, to show that it works. And so uh, towards this end, again, we're, we're inviting all to bring in in an open, continuous 365 day a year plug fest to prove out any scenario or use case that needs to be proven for our customers. So as the partners mentioned, this is happening now and, and you can move to IP. The tooling, uh, the telemetry is there, the incorporation of the orchestration platforms is happening. The productivity and resource efficiency, we are absolutely focusing on to scavenge the, the cycles that are available. And then incorporating uh, all the different technologies that are necessary versus just requiring that the solution fits the technology. Instead, focus on the solution because any technology will work underneath it. So where we want to go with the future of television as well is incorporating more and more of the capabilities of our portfolio to enable a, a new and different media experience. We've shown with the Tour de France over the last several years that the incorporation of our IoT and access capabilities to the racers themselves and to the bicycles can be incorporated directly into the, uh, the broadcast experience in new and different ways. And we worked with uh, Dimension Data uh, to do this over the last several years. Also, the personalized unicast media delivery becomes really a key piece. Not only are we trying to personalize the content, but incorporate the, uh, a new and different and better use of concurrent devices as well, and I'll show you an example in a second, to control that personalized experience from camera angle to understanding the actual content in the media itself. We've worked with a number of um, on-site but mobile production facilities, and we're trying to take uh, setups that look like this outside sporting events and reduce them down to a very, very small amount of equipment that may be necessary um, to deploy at a large stadium. In addition, we want to change what it's like to have an immersive social experience, you know, in this case in a sports bar, perhaps directly in the, in the stadium itself, where different camera angles are available to different users on different devices at the same time, enjoying the, the exact same experience. Of course, a larger incorporation of, of social media is always there as well. And then last, really focus on the creation of very, very unique experiences, whether it's social with video, uh, multi-site video uh, collaboration, but also just the different types of data that can be brought to that experience, creating, as the partners know, much um, potentially more complex workflows, but much richer in content and of very, very high value. So the use of concurrent devices, and this is interesting, working with a number of, of sporting uh, customers that we have, is the use of concurrent devices to change the synchronized, uh, sorry, change the camera angle that's being used and change the content that's available on my, on my, uh, on my display device as I work with all the devices that I have to be able to receive the content and experience it the way that I want to um, at any time. And then if we can really step forward in what we can show um, is being able to have multi-display, but multi-display in a new way. So what I wanna, where I wanna take this now is we're also incorporating on the production side fundamentally new ways of using video collaboration with IoT, with the workflow orchestration that we have, such that producers in London can work directly with those uh, creating the content and capturing the content in the field. And so what you see here is the use of telepresence for the, the producer here in London, working with a director on site, being able to see the actual uh, capture of that content. And then on the left-hand side is in fact the setup or the topology of those capture devices and how that workflow is being created and pushed into both the physical infrastructure as well as virtual infrastructure and get the telemetry out of it. So we're working on this back in, in Silicon Valley. Next, change to an immersive sporting experience with multiple camera angles available, statistics available, et cetera. Again, something that uh, we have put together over the last six months. Bring in gaming into 
uh, the sports experience directly as you're watching the, watching the event, and then be able to change recreation. So in this particular case, you've got your golf pro working with you in a virtual, in this case, a virtual golfing environment, be having a different immersive experience associated with the screens, using projection from, from above to, to create the setting that you're working in, and then to be able to display your stats and what's going on with a virtual course at that time. Same thing with tennis, with your tennis pro. Same thing with, with uh, yoga in this particular case. You've got your guru there and you're having a social experience to be able to do what was once just a personalized experience, sorry, a single experience staring at a display. And you can now take, as we had uh, personalized content being um, broadcast or for the sporting event or unicast directly for the sporting event, you can take this to other experiences that uh, haven't been available in the industry yet. Change the immersive theater experience as well. We're working towards this, um, or concepts like this uh, with Disney, for example. We also use it very differently in our portfolio, and I, I just want to use this as a teaser to show how we can, in safety and public safety between medical, police, and fire, and our smart cities deployments, be able to bring in IoT data, camera feeds, and have a different operational control room for those emergency response uh, facilities as well. We use these immersive labs between London, Paris, and Silicon Valley, where my teams are located, and use this for an immersive coding and development experience. So one point, there was a hackathon where a bunch of people get into the same room. Then there was the open telephone line that was there for, at, at all times. And now you can get into an immersive uh, co-development environment, and we do this all day, every day, across uh, the sites that work for me. Uh, next, what I wanted to mention is that what we have here, actually, is something that we showed at CES with the smart car case, where we're able to see information coming about the fleet of vehicles that are, that are going down the road, understanding um, the wear and tear on those vehicles, understanding hotspots, and, and deducing for the car vehicle manufacturer, the fleet manufacturer, how to, how to manage that particular fleet. So next, I'd like to invite Pierre back up for a moment and just talk a bit about how everything I just walked through really, really quickly, uh, you managed to deploy, but actually I think you wanted to uh, give a bit more on, on how this worked out. Yeah, I will try. <laughs> so this is just uh, in progress, let's say. So first idea we had is, uh, I was, uh, Brad Gilmer said two years ago, and then Ibiza, you have to consider moving from SDI to IP, not as, uh, as a just uh, uh, um, uh, um, something which is finished, but uh, just as a step, which enables something uh, different. So we saw in the panels that you talk about new workflow, new way of. So we start to think about, and so we draw this, uh, what I used to say monkey drawing, sorry about that. Um, so what first- did you just call me Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the idea is, okay, uh, underneath, first thing is, we, we need, okay, thank you. We need to, to put all together all the signal processing and the process we need to handle because we need to share, we need to leverage uh, the equipment we have, for instance, when you know that when we, we run a gallery, we use a gallery, uh, let's say, two, three, four hours a day as a maximum. And so the 20 hours, the equipment is free of charge, is, um, is available, and so on, so on, so on. So first idea is to, to make a pool of equipment, whatever they are. So at this time, we have still a lot of uh, dedicated hardware because uh, the technology is not yet ready. But the idea is to move from uh, um, dedicated hardware to <coughs> generic IT-based platform when we can use the same processing for different things and different features and different things we need to do. And one interesting thing is the balance between real-time processing, live processing, and non-real-time processing. And we can envision, for instance, in the future, 
to have uh, some, uh, some process for the live event we need so to have the, the capability to, to deploy some live processing, but to use what is not used for, for instance, transcoding or AI in the future of metadata management and so on, so on. So, so that's a, a way to, to manage and to leverage the, the equipment we can put in a, in a, in a data center or whatever. So what, what we envision, oh, it was, uh, wait, yeah. what we envision, so it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, bench of processing, whatever it will be, hard, uh, dedicated based, uh, hardware dedicated or generic IT, and to have a kind of processing management on the top of it, just to be able to deploy on demand what we need. So uh, the first deployment we can think about is the MCR, when we re when receive line, contribution line, and exchange line, and exchange uh, file ba uh, signal based format with uh, external, um, external venues. And maybe we can imagine to have some uh, uh, conversion, uh, logo insertion, and whatever uh, could, uh, could deploy on demand on this one. So, so the first thing is media uh, processing. The next step uh, on the journey would be the transmission of the playout. As we know nowadays, the, uh, the playout could be virtualized, let's say. Uh, so the idea is maybe we have this uh, processing management tool we are looking for, so just an idea, maybe we can deploy on demand uh, the playout. So it could be uh, maybe uh, during a day we have a N plus P redundancy on the playout and maybe we have a big event. So we want to move this channel from N plus P redundancy to, to one plus one, for instance. Or we want to move this channel from a stock channel to a live channel. Sometimes we have this issue. So th the idea is this uh, NOC processing management tools we are looking for would be able to, uh, to trigger the deployments on the processing platform, uh, a new setup, a new topology of the, of the playout. Same thing for the post-production. Post-production is more or less now virtualized. And the last but not the least, of course, is production. So production will stay for a moment between maybe uh, a generic IT-based platform and dedicated, uh, dedicated hardware, because as we know, for instance, for the switcher, for the big capacity, it's difficult to go to IT-based. But the important thing is to have a, a pool management of resources, whatever it will be uh, generic or dedicated hardware. This is for the processing management. And a new idea came also on the table was can we also invent, and I assume it's the idea you, you mentioned from NBCU, uh, can you invent also a new way to, uh, to operate those processing? And so the other layer, the upper layer, is the operation management we envision. And for instance, to go to a play out, we can envision for a, for a, for a channel to have a, some period where you have only stock form uh, program to to be uh, to, to be uh, play out, so we can uh, run the channel in a in a control room with a lot of channels, and when we have some live event, maybe we'll uh, switch the control of this channel from the big area to a dedicated area for uh, for live channel or to the gallery, which will be on air. Uh, something from the edit suite or the pop post-production suite, we can um, uh, imagine to have something in which we can deploy on demand both uh, the processing, I mean the editing station or the graphic station or the terrestrial station, and, uh, and uh, the, the suite by itself and give access to, uh, to people to what they need. And same thing for the galleries. So galleries, maybe uh, we can set up what can have some template of different galleries, small, uh, medium, large, depending on what we need to do. And we have the, the same idea to have some template production control rooms when we'll be able to set up and to adapt the number of operation people to what we need. And the main idea of this is everything is done remotely and the quality of the experience will uh, rely on the quality of the network. So this could be a data center, this could be two data center, this could be on the cloud, this could be on premise. So important layer will be this orchestration layer in order to be able to manage and to deploy in a very efficient manner uh, <coughs> what has been triggered or asked by the processing management. 
And of course, we have still some external contribution coming in and getting out. And as you mentioned, maybe I can add some, uh, maybe some new process, because as soon as we have all the material coming in one central location, we can have some uh, distribution processing, we can ask, just to have some uh, personal experience, as you say, and unicast and these things or things, so have some AI or whatever. So you can imagine as soon as you bring all, all the feeds in one location, in uh, one common platform, let's say, we can maybe envision to have a new way also to distribute the content, as you mentioned. That's more or less where, what we try to do, and um, um, I just present briefly uh, uh, Studio de Boulogne, which was the flagship of Vivendi, but when, uh, when Mr. Bolo, which is uh, running the Bolloré Group, which is the grandmother company of, uh, of Canon Plus, uh, he said, okay, we'll set up this, <coughs> these studios, but I want that all the uh, media uh, activities of Vivendi Group should be set up near uh, this, uh, those studios. So there is a project now to move all the media activities not so far in Nils Hogan, which is not so far from uh, Sudo de Boulogne. And the idea is maybe by 2022, you have this kind of, of thing set up, uh, and this new way to operate and to adapt uh, both the processing and the operation to what we need in less, more or less real time thanks to the planning we will get in Europe. That's roughly the idea in, on which we, we will work on it, and, and that illustrates for us the benefit we get moving from SDI to IP, and to IT, of course. Thank you, Pierre. So he's got his vision of how he wants the Nell Plus to work. We work extremely closely with our partners to create those workflows, and Cisco's focusing on everything below that red line because the gallery for us is a, is a physical virtual topology that needs to be orchestrated. The, all of the processing platforms, again, are different topologies that need to be orchestrated and analyzed. And so we all continue to work in our role in the industry, and uh, we're going to move this together very rapidly and easily hit that date, Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how easy, but we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. Okay. So, um, so just in conclusion, um, if, you, you know, if you also see this vision that, uh, that we have, Really, you know, I thank you very much for listening to this talk, and then also, um, you know, join with us to be able to to uh, move forward towards this journey. So, thank you very much. Stay there. Stay here. Stay here. If I can borrow Pierre as well, we'll just see if anyone has any questions for either Dave or Sorry. Pierre on the future of media before we move into the afternoon session. Question in the back. Yeah. Hi there, just want to say great vision. Thank you. How far away do you think you are from sorting out the packet pacing issues on a VM in terms of multiple flows in and out? Do you see that as an issue? Is Let's uh, get your opinion on that. I, I think we've proven it. And I think we, and we've open sourced it, as I mentioned. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. 10 gigs, 12 gigs, 40 gig, 100 gig, that's all par for the course now. We know that we can uh, process on a 2RU computer one terabit bidirectionally of traffic using 17% of the CPU, leaving 83% left for, for the partners in the workflow processing. Um, so multiple streams aren't the problem. 400 gigs, not the problem. 800 gig bidirectional isn't really the problem yet. And so as Cisco continues to work forward towards the fast and fastest and fastest speeds for the greatest efficiency of that equipment, um, right now pacing streams, pacing multiple streams uh, isn't an issue uh, for us in software as well as hardware. Is that through work that you've done working with the NICs and writing drivers for the NICs specifically? No, because I do not Sorry, I would not prefer that Cisco is in the NIC support business. So instead, we utilize DPDK uh, because that gives us a nice abstraction on top of all NICs. Uh, and, uh, and if, if uh, sorry, and it gives us abstraction on top of all NICs. And so therefore, we can program DPDK to give us a direct pipeline of that I.O. coming directly into our virtual switch router, which is, as I mentioned, uh, extremely efficient, can fling a terabit per second on a, on a computer. So yes, uh, to avoid that NIC problem, several years ago we were in the NIC support business, and now we're 
you know, one of the leading contributors to DBDK and moving that forward with Intel. Great. Thanks a lot. Yep. So what I'd like to just give you a preview of what I want to talk about or what we might talk about at IBC and, and at the next time we get together is really how to secure the workflows, how to create workflow enclaves such that not only is it protected by bandwidth and potential statistical multiplexing and rogue flows and rogue applications on, on CPUs, but also how to secure the content during uh, mid-flow and in the work stream, how to link together identity of, an, of a broadcast engineer to the role in the organization, to the content and applications they should be able to run. As we've been automating and orchestrating network compute and storage, we've now taken on automating security operations as well and incorporating that into our, into our uh, data center orchestration. And that's what we'll be showing at EBC this September. So to the, to the person who asked about um, how we're incorporating security features, uh, We'll have quite a bit to talk about the next time we get together uh, later this summer. So thank you very much again.